Thank you, Todd. Wow, what an honor to be here. I'm going to go home and write on my Vita that I was here at the, the Biola Chapel. It's a real honor. Uh, I heard so much about what's going on at Biola lately that I'm glad to be here to see it for myself and see what God is doing here. What I want to do today and tomorrow is to talk about ways in which God is uh, not only an, an awesome God, but also an intimate God, how God shows up in our everyday life. And I think sometimes we don't recognize God, and we need to think about ways in which God is caring about the things that we care about. And so that basically a thesis that I'm going to be expounding is, is the fact that, is that God cares about things we care about. You stop to think about the way Jesus ministers to people. He always starts with where, where people are, what, what they care about, what, what, they, what they love, or sometimes what they need. He starts with, in other words, their everyday life. All my life, I've been thinking about how God shows up in culture, but, but lately, I've been thinking about those special projects of people's lives, what, what I've come to call the poetics of, of your life. Those things, those special things that you do uh, that, that are important to you, that incite your affection or spark your creativity. Uh, I've come to believe that these things, these spaces in your life, these, these poetic spaces in your life are important not only for you, but they're also important for God. It might seem that video games, sports, family celebrations, are not religious in any traditional sense, but I also believe that these activities are not merely something that fill up time. Rather, for many people, they function like religious practices. That is, they become things that people live for. These practices and projects make up what I'm calling the poetics of life. They include formally aesthetic practices like art and music, but they also include things we usually think of as as hobbies or recreation. Uh, all these things we do because, not because we have to do them, but because we love doing them. These are what I'm calling poetic projects. One person loves art and follows the latest exhibitions. Another keeps up with the latest music and her favorite band. Another enjoys fishing or another runs marathons. These are their poetic projects. These are things that in many ways stand at the very center of their identity. Now these express something about our lives that I've learned from St. Augustine, and I hope you learn to make him a, a close friend before you finish your education. Uh, St. Augustine says that what's important about you is not how much you know, but what you love and who you love. These define who you are. These make you the kind of person that, that, you, that you are. When you stop to think about it, your life probably revolves around these things in many ways. They shape you. These targets of desire become projects. They become things that you make and build. Games, celebration, hobbies, these are invested with with deep emotional and symbolic meaning. I'm impressed that when somebody dies, the thing that we remember about them is what they loved doing. You know how we say, oh, she loved this, or he loved that, and that is what we remember about them. Reminds me of the end of one of Philip Larkin's poem that says, "What." What what's, will survive of us is love. Of course, many people do not think about God when they pursue these things, but that doesn't mean that they're without religious meaning, I think. And that's because of who God is and how God has made the world and put it together. The very fact that these things embody things that we care about suggests, I think, an implicit religious impulse. They, they are our attempts to try to display the glory of God with all the goods of creation, which God has invested with so much beauty and so much goodness. 
Desire, in other words, represents our impulse to reach out beyond ourselves, to form relationships, to make objects that we care about and that are beautiful for us. Octavio Paz says, desire is a shot fired in the direction of the world beyond. Poetic projects are evidence, I think, of the fact that, that, that all of us don't want a life that just sort of functions well. We don't want to just get along. We want a life that, that has a, a texture to it, a beautiful life. We want to live well. People want to make something new of their lives. Over the long stretch of their lives, they want to put all the things together that they're doing into a, a kind of melody, a kind of thing that makes a, a, a beautiful uh, a life for themselves. And I think what's important about this is the desire that we have, our love for things, is, is what gets us up in the morning. It's what motivates us. It, it, it's what keeps us going. But you ask, how can these impulses, which might be important for us, be important for God? Well, I believe they are important because they, they, rep, they represent our human connections with each other, with the, the goods of the created order, which is the gift of God. And they also represent the deep longing that all of us have for a connection with God. People, because they are made in God's image, can, can reach out and form relationships with other people. They can make projects and artifacts that are beautiful. But, but here's the most important point of, of all, is that this is important because God, from his part, wants a relationship with us. God desires us even more than we long for him. So these projects become things that people live for. That is, they become symbolic. What I want to underline is the the, the dimension of the aesthetic in all of this. Most of this, I've been struck by the fact when somebody makes a beautiful shot in basketball, we say, beautiful! That's not beautiful. That's just... But it is. There's something about it that, that, that's beautiful. There's, a, there's an aesthetic dimension to it. The look and the feel of it attracts us. My claim is in, in these symbolic practices, what, what you see is, a, is what you might call an aesthetic of everyday life. I've been helped here by Robert Gosueta's discussion of aesthetics in relation to justice. Guaceto uh, sees the central core moment of aesthetics as a, what he calls empathetic fusion. Aesthetics draws us into relationships that are effective, which means that this movement is allied with love, he thinks. And this is what he says. Play, recreation, celebration are the most authentic forms of life. Pre- precisely, Because when we are playing, recreating, or celebrating, we are immersed or fused with what we are doing, with those other persons with whom we are participating. Thus, we are involved in and enjoying the living itself. So these symbolic practices, I'm claiming, are important even with respect to truth and morality. They are a way of our gaining access to what the world is about. While the symbol has to have some sort of meaning to it, it's really not about truth or the intellect. It is not centrally a way of knowing. It's more what you might call a kind of wisdom, a way of steering in the world. After celebrating an encounter with your precocious niece, after a long, intimate conversation with a close friend, we know something about ourselves and about the world that we didn't know before. While there are moral dimensions to this, they are not primarily about goodness, for it is the aesthetic dimension that increases the influence of these things in our lives. It it ramps up the values of these things. Love wants to move toward the other because desire has to become fulfilled in love. Now I know some of you are saying, these projects, however important they are, can't really change us. 
There's nothing they can do in themselves to make us better people. Only, only God can, can, can do that. St. Augustine had to wrestle with that question as well. During his time, there was a stoic idea that, that life was about living well. And he said what was wrong with that was that living well is agent-oriented. In other words, it's about me and my feelings and my satisfaction. But Augustine had to see that, that that desire had to be turned into love. That is, he had to have an encounter with the other who was God in order to understand fully what his desire really meant, the direction that it was really moving. That was what the secret was for him. So he changed his understanding of desire to focus on, on, on love. Because the desire I'm talking about is not ultimately about me and my satisfaction. It is about the other, either the object that I'm working on, the game, or, 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 or the relationship of the, of the other, the person that I care about and that I've invested myself in. I think that this is very important because it's, desire in this case is a movement towards something of real value. It's, it's towards something that really matters something worth loving. And that's why I think this is a, a kind of small image of what will eventually become repentance. It is the first step in our movement toward God. G.K. Chesterton says in one place, do not enjoy yourself. Enjoy dances and theaters and joy rides and champagne and oysters. Enjoy jazz, cocktails, and nightclubs, and if you can no enjoy nothing better, enjoy bigamy and burglary and any crime in the calendar, but never learn to enjoy yourself. At least, he says, those crimes shift your attention away from yourself toward, toward something else. Now, as long, Chesterton said, one can only be happy as long as you retain the receptive power and the power of reaction and surprise and gratitude to something outside yourself. Of course, there's always the possibility that one will destroy or mu misuse something that you treasure, that it become an idol. But one also has the, the ability to make good even out of bad situations, to redeem them in the way that God redeems people and situations. And, and this is true because this is the way God has put the world together. It reflects God's own deep love for us. It represents most clearly in Jesus Christ because it shows us what love looks like. I like your chapel theme this year, this place proclaiming the good news in a changing world. And I want to speak about that here in conclusion. That outsiders have an, a negative view of the church and Christianity does not come as a surprise to anyone, I'm sure. And I think there are many reasons for that, but I would like to call attention to one important reason in my experience, people outside the church have the feeling that Christians do not really understand them or care about the things that they care about, as though Christians were replacing their game app with a Bible app, you know. Uh, but if what I'm saying is true, if the poetic side of life is the key to our spiritual development and the development of our friends, then these things that they care about, these spaces and places in their life that are objects of their desire and their love are not only important to, to them, but somehow they matter deeply to God as well. And that God in those spaces is getting their attention, is calling out to them. One of my doctoral students recently studied an emergent church. He was studying the most successful evangelistic churches in Europe. 
and he studied a emergent church in Belgium that had developed a really unusual outreach ministry. Rather than going out as Christians and having evangelistic meetings in various places in the city, they first decided to study all the social service programs that were, were a part of the, the, the city of Brussels where they were and they decided to join the one that was the most successful and the most exciting. You see, what they were doing was not claiming the truth and, and the higher ground for themselves, but finding that, that place, those spaces, where these people lived out the poetics of their life, the things they cared about because they knew that those would be the places where God would be at work. And they were right, and their work is very successful. So, so if this is all, there's something to this, and what means part of our ministry is discovering where people find their, their, their meaning, find their, their times of delight, what they, what they care about, what they love, and encouraging them to look for God in those places. Uh, a great example I came across recently of this, David Nantes uh, uh, is a, a priest, a Catholic priest working in a university ministry in Detroit. He recently wrote a piece about his own spiritual life. Uh, and he used exactly the terms that, that, I'm, that I'm talking about here today. He confesses to passing through a period of emotional and spiritual exhaustion in his ministry, which led him to, to take a personal weekend spiritual retreat. At the beginning of the retreat, he described to his spiritual director, Mark, his lack of desire to pray, his, his feeling cold toward God. His director asked him, is there anything in your life that is particularly enjoyable for you, uh, for which you are particularly grateful right now? And he thought, wow, I hadn't thought about that. But he immediately remembered that during the last six months, he had discovered in retreats with some, some of his high school students, what he's ministering to, a whole new, a, a new area of rock music that he'd never explored before. And he loved it. This had tapped into a joy and playfulness in him that he had never seen before. As soon as he started talking about this, Mark noticed the excitement in his voice with which he spoke about this poetic space in his life. He encouraged him to, to go into that space to meet God. David reports that this forever changed the way he thought about the spiritual life. Let me quote his own testimony. I had never thought about my love for rock music in this way of going closer to God, as a way of growing closer to God. Prayer, I thought, was meant to occur in silence. But Mark suggested that I find God within the passion that I felt listening for, to rock. The rest of the retreat, I prayed this way. And eventually, through working through my preconceived notions of what prayer was supposed to be, I found great peace. Now I realize the euphoria and experience I feel when listening to rock is a gift from God for which I should express gratitude. That retreat also helped me to discover a sense of how big God is. God truly can be found in all things. What else do we have to bring to God in prayer but this stuff of our lives? It strikes me that what David had discovered was what Paul has encouraged us to learn how to pray without ceasing, to find God in those places where our love and our desire is stimulating. But it also made me think about something else. Reading this 
made me reflect on the spiritual dryness that we all experience from time to time, but also the kind of dryness and coldness towards spiritual things that non-Christians feel. Perhaps, for many people, they have not found anything that's life-giving for them. And so they love nothing, and therefore they have no vehicle by which God can enter their souls. And that's a great pity. This recalls Henry David Thoreau's words, most people, people live, too many people live, lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Well, this is only the introduction and I'd like to fill out some of the details of this tonight and talk about the biblical grounds for this and then tomorrow think about the way in which art and these poetic spaces can deal with things when they go badly, when things are not going well and what role art can play in that. But I hope you can see from what I've said already that the movement that I'm talking about goes in two directions. First of all, the symbolic practices of our everyday life, the things that we love and care about, the spaces in our lives that give us joy, that <clears throat> things for which we get up in the morning, these are, are, are point beyond themselves to God. These call for a larger narrative, a larger structure in which they find their full meaning. And they, they, they represent God's gifts to us and God's own longing for us. And they move us to, de- to, to, to seek deeper symbols, deeper, deeper reality, which is ultimately to be found only in God. Because we love, because God first loved us. So the desires evoked in the poetics of everyday life, if followed faithfully and illumined by the gospel and the word of God, as I'll argue tonight, can move people toward God and can be truly and fully enjoyed only in God. St. Augustine said we need to learn to love all of these things in God and God in all things. But I want you to notice too that the direction is not only toward God and toward worship, but it's the other direction as well. The rich practices and joyful music of worship offer a deeper meaning to all that we enjoy outside of church. Now here's the positive thrust of poetic theology. The realization of God's loving embrace does nothing to undermine and everything to illumine the meaning and enjoyment of these embodied pleasures. When we find in God our final ground, we can enjoy our games, our music, our celebrations, and our family more fully in their own way and in their own place. And it's also, I think, the case that in the, it's in music, music and in worship and in our corporate structures of worship that we find our desires oriented properly. We find them that our disordered desires properly aligned as they should be. Augustine understood this larger context for desire very well. And he says in his confessions, there is a light I love and a food and a kind of embrace when I love my God, where there is perfume which no breeze disperses, where there is a taste for food no amount of eating can lessen, and where there is a bond of union that no satiety can part. That is what I love when I love my God. Now it's true, the aesthetic turn has led to a frantic search for mystical experiences, addictive behavior, and so forth, but the abuse of the goods of creation underline their indispensability. It should not lead us to deny their source in God and in God's created purposes. What we cannot do, despite these deviations, 
is ignore the turn to style that's going on around us everywhere because it provides a unique opportunity for Christians to enter and reframe the poetic spaces of our neighbors, convincing them that life does not find its true center in various events and diversions, however exciting, but that it involves integrating these into our narrative of a journey to God. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.